Good to go. Good to go. Well, hello everyone. This is Rocco Pisto, your host for Michigan Watercolor Society's Art Talk. And uh, today we have a special guest, uh, Peter Gooch, or should I say Professor Peter Gooch, or Professor Emeritus P Peter Gooch? Or just old Peter Gooch? Or old <laughs> Peter Gooch. And uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I'm, I'm letting people in as we go along here. Uh, Peter was at Eastern Michigan when a number of us were there in uh, Kingsley Calkins' advanced watercolor class. And uh, so I had a chance to meet him back then. And, uh, and the name always stuck. And, and Peter was pretty active with Michigan Watercolor. And we'll talk about that as well. So uh, before we get started, I've got a few announcements to make. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everyone that uh, submitted in this year's 76th annual exhibition. Uh, we'll be sending out as soon as we get everything cleaned up, we'll be sending it out to the juror here pretty soon to uh, pick the top 60 out of 180 some paintings uh, for this year's annual exhibition at Hope College at the Krasinga Museum in Holland this year. The workshop information with our juror will come in as well here shortly. We'll be doing the workshop at uh, Hope College in the art department. So that's gonna be neat, just like going back to college. Uh, everyone should be getting a donation letter from Michigan Watercolor to donate, to support our awards and all those kind of things. So uh, you know, if you feel uh, like jet uh, donating, please do. We we need the money to, you know, to keep these awards up. Last year was kind of a banner year since it was our 75th annual. We uh, we gave out about $8,000 worth of awards, which was a lot for us, but uh, I don't think we'll be doing that this year. And if you enjoy these art talks, like we had one with Edie Jopic a few weeks ago and others uh, that you'll find in our YouTube channel, the Michigan Watercolor Society YouTube channel, uh, Feel free to suggest people that you think would be of interest to us as a as a group to uh, to hear their story. And in the process, I, you know, since it's being recorded, uh, the uh, you know it's kind of going into our archives of, of videos of people that uh, you know I think were important to the group. So. Uh, think about that. Just you can send things to me. I'm, I'm sure everyone's got my email address. But Peter, thank you for uh, joining. We were trying to do this in December, and uh, you were dealing with some uh, health issues, so we pushed it back. And it looks like you're doing great. Uh, still upright and semi-lucid. No, that's great. So let's. Uh, I want to do. I want to just read a little bio, Peter Gooch, for those that don't know him or never heard of him. But Peter was born in 1947 in Ann Arbor. He graduated from University High School in '65, entered the University of Michigan uh, in '65, and then in '67 he accompanied, accompanied his dad to India and Nepal on a grant from the University of Michigan. In 68, he enlisted in the Air Force. Uh, and then in 73 through 78, he attended Eastern Michigan where he received the Bachelor's of Science in English Literature and a Bachelor's of Fine Arts. And in 83, he enrolled in a Master's of Fine Art program at Western Michigan University, received his degree in 85. After teaching part-time at Eastern for a year, he moved to Dayton, Ohio, to teach at the University of Dayton, and I think that's where you spent your collegiate career teaching-wise. Uh, he served on the board of the Ann Arbor Art Association and the Michigan Watercolor Society. Uh, he was awarded an Ohio Individual Awards Fellowship as well, summer research, some other things at the University of Dayton. 
and his work can be found in public collections, including the University of Michigan Museum of Art and numerous other places. So that's Pete, Peter Gooch. Peter, uh, any comments before we get started? Yeah, um, well, first of all, yeah, the, the BIOS is very accurate. And I wanted to, uh, before we start um, with questions and so forth, just thank you for the amazing job that you've done with the Watercolor Society and for doing this kind of thing, which of course, back in the old days when I was involved with them, there was no such thing as Zoom or anything <laughs> like that. So, um, but I think the, the publicity uh, and the energy uh, and the, the innovations that you brought to the Watercolor Society are really impressive. And, and uh, I'm really glad you're doing this. I know it must take a tremendous amount of time um, you know, out of your life, but I will say that at least from my vantage, it's well worth it. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, you know, you, you and Paula got involved right away out of college, basically, and uh, mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't at the time. Of course, at that time, I didn't know what I was doing anyway, so I wouldn't have been much use. But uh, after 40 years in the sales world and technology and all that stuff, uh, it seemed fitting that I'd be involved during COVID and all these things where we had to move on to electronics. But uh, let's talk about your, your education. So you went to U of M and did you, did you study art at U of M? Um, no, I studied philosophy and English literature at U of M um, for two years. Uh, my, uh, the summer, of, or actually the, the winter of my uh, junior year, I accompanied dad um, on a Rackham um, grant, which was part of his sabbatical research um, um, to India and Nepal. Uh, we, or he designed the trip so that we would essentially circumnavigate um, the planet. And so that was, uh, that was my junior year, as it were, and probably a better education than I could have gotten at any university. Sure. And then you came to Eastern, and uh, and it looks like you went into English as well there as, as one of your degrees. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then you got I was into just the add I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to add the, that um, when I decided um, to transfer to Eastern, uh, the the first thing in my mind was to do it for art. Uh, the reason I took a degree in English from, from Eastern was that I had so many credits from Michigan and so on. And, and um, my, my father and Richard Wilt both recommended that I go to Eastern instead of U of M in art, although they were both U of M art faculty. Um, and Eastern turned out to be um, a, a major kind of awakening uh, for me partly because the faculty, for whatever reason, um, were willing to talk to students. Uh, and that was not, I, I, I did not find that to be true at U of M. So I felt quite embraced from the very first semester at Eastern with Charles McGee and, and um, Richard Washington. I felt very embraced by the faculty and that made um, going to school um, very, very different than the large sort of anonymous classes uh, that I was doing at U of M. Although, of course, U of M was my home and I went to high school right down on central campus. So um, it wasn't a matter of not feeling comfortable. It was a matter of simply finding a faculty that was sort of on my same wavelength. Well, speaking of your dad, uh, for those that don't know, uh, Donald Gooch was one of the founding members of the Michigan Watercolor Society. And uh, I just lost. Uh, you're there, Peter. Someone. I'm, I'm, I can see there you. Go. There okay. you go. And I want to talk to you. Know what was that experience like having your dad? Uh, I want to show my screen because I want to start showing some slides before talking. So, uh, let's see, there we go. Let's see here, this screen. You gave me this piece to kind of show of your dad's work. 
uh, what, what was the experience of working or living with your dad? Uh, I'm not seeing the painting, but I certainly can tell you. Um, it's the, that, uh, can anyone see the painting? Paula, can you see it? No. Okay, I, I've got sharing. Uh, let's see if I maybe don't have the screen popped up. Uh, Oh, let me know if you see it. Uh, I'm still seeing the menu. Okay, darn it. I'm gonna get this up here. Uh, always something, learning as we go. You are sharing, You're, you are screen sharing. Okay, good, that's good. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Uh, <clears throat> Don't know why it's not saying. Like that. Go here. Stop sharing. That brings us all back. Okay, we're back. I can see you. Right. Uh, let's see. Paul Tara uh, is joining. Uh, let me just see if there's any other little trick that I need. Oh, that's just sheer sound. Or video. And it's, it just popped right up. Participants can now see your application. And you, yeah, and you can't see it. <laughs> View. I, I, I can still see the menu, and I, and I think you're clicking on the yellow house um, in, right. Fontainebleau, in Fontainebleau. And I actually I sent you that one for a couple of reasons. One, one pretty practical, and that is that it's a piece that I still own and, and is hanging in my house, um, but also because it's a very, very early painting that my dad did when he was studying art at the Fontainebleau School near Paris before the war. And that painting particularly reminds me um, of the rather di different definition of watercolor that existed certainly pre-war, uh, post-war, uh, and up through maybe the 70s when watercolor was considered uh, only to be transparent work done on paper. Uh, and my dad was, was not at all dogmatic about rules for art, but oh, when, he, um, when, when he painted on paper, um, he used very <laughs> traditional materials uh, and methods, um, even though I think he considered himself primarily uh, an oil painter. Okay. And you sent me, and boy, this really upsets me that I can't show these things, but uh, uh, I don't, don't well, know why. Well, that's okay. Um, I think the, the images are helpful, but not necessary. And you sent me something from, uh, his name is Lopez. Yeah, Carlos Lopez. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a watercolor as well, looks like. Yes, indeed. He was, uh, he was on faculty um, in the U of M art department and also in several places in Detroit um, for the post-war period up until his death in 1953. He and my dad were not only colleagues, but they were very, very close friends. So as a boy, I actually, after Carlos's death, um, I lived with... Um, a, a great many of his wor uh, works um, because we were storing them for the Lopez family after Carlos's death. And uh, when Rhoda Lopez moved to California with, with uh, her sons. Okay. Uh, let's see, I'm trying this again, to see if there's any other trick that I'm missing. Because uh, I want to talk to these pieces but maybe one of the more salient points would be um, that these were the pieces I sent you 
among many, many others, uh, were works of art that I grew up with from essentially from from birth. Um, okay. They were all hang hanging in our house in Ann Arbor. Um, and so these pieces, all of which I still own, um, have been with me essentially for three quarters of a century. Wow. And again, nobody can see these, right? They're not popping I up, Peter? See, I can not see for me, no. thumbnails mm -hmm. of them. Okay, so that's screen. In the folder. <laughs> Well, yeah, and the one on the right is, is Richard Wilt, who was a huge influence on on my life and, and on my early work. Um, somebody that I admired intensely, uh, a colleague of my father's. And uh, in all truth, I think one of the paradigms in my world for what it was to be a, a, a painter. Okay. And those of you that knew that knew Dick, if there are any, uh, will remember him as um, uh, extraordinarily short on speech, um, uh, rather cryptic. Uh, but he de he developed a, um, a way of producing watercolor images um, through putting objects on wet paper and flowing paint around them, and and that was something that inspired my attempts at innovation. And did, did his wife teach at Eastern, Paula? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Bonnie yeah. is a great artist on, on, in her own right and a I'm, tremendous watercolorist. I think and she's she, the one that taught us drawing. Probably, yeah. yeah I never had her for a class, but um, I knew and, and liked Bonnie very much. They lived... Uh, just down the hill from us on, you know, in Ann Arbor. Or Bonnie did, Dick did not. Okay. Oh, Marco, could you click on the thumbnails to see if they'll enlarge? Or if I, you have more than yeah, one screen? Yeah, I, I have been clicking on the thumbnails and uh, and okay. all I'm, you guys aren't seeing it, I'm seeing it. I mean, I'm blowing these up, they're full screen for me. Uh, and okay. you're not seeing it. No, not. Um, do you have two monitors? What's that? I do I have do one? have two monitors, but it's uh, everything's working off of uh, one monitor. Okay. All right. Uh, so, at least from from my perspective. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Let me get back here. I'm, you can't see those, but I'll. I'm going to share these images after the presentation. Yeah since that's not working, but uh, I'm gonna bring these up. And, Peter, and I wanna... in my view, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go I was ahead. just gonna say, in, in my view, the, uh, the reason that I chose those particular images is simply to illustrate um, the traditional way watercolor was viewed around the time that the Watercolor Society was founded even though there was some pretty, um, there was a pretty wide range of techniques and subject matter uh, from the founders um, for the most part. And it's probably dangerous for me to try to speak for them, um, but at least in my recollection, for the most part, watercolor was considered once again, as I said, transparent on paper, um, the traditional watercolor that you and I and Paula and numerous other people learned uh, at Eastern under Igor Beginin and King Calkins. Right. And, and your experience, especially through your dad, of being around some of the founders, that must have been kind of a neat experience. I, yeah, for me, I, frankly, um, I thought that was normal uh, until I got older. <laughs> <laughs> so they were essentially friends and one of the one of the great virtues of that situation in other words being surrounded by my father's colleagues and other members of the Ann Arbor art community as well as Detroit art community one of the one of the great advantages was that 
I, from very early on, came to see professors as people. And what that allowed me, allowed me to do was not to expect perfection from any one teacher, uh, but rather see education as an aggregate experience. In other words, one teacher might provide one insight, another teacher might provide another, et cetera, et cetera. For instance, I, don't, I never worked with Mary Jane Bigler, uh, much to my regret, um, but being around her was an education in itself. And I'm sure that Marilyn Dewinskis could um, back me up on that. Uh, and Mary Jane was, was one of a type of professors that existed back in the 50s and 60s that sadly have become rare birds in today's academe. Um, she knew a lot of stuff. She wasn't afraid to say it. Um, she wasn't fearful of insulting anybody <laughs> from the president on down, a pre a president of the university on down. And she was a, she was a very bold woman. And I think uh, for those that were lucky enough to work with her for a prolonged period, uh, a tremendous role model um, for approaching art uh, and in my case, academe. And you've gone from a lot of different directions with your work. I mean, I, I know you've, you've done a lot of watercolor but you've kind of moved into more just like the piece behind you, which is more acrylic in nature, though it looks like watercolor. Well, yeah, and, and in truth, Rocco, um, I was never all that comfortable with those hard and fast definitions of the medium. Um, I was certainly always interested in painting and I included watercolor right in the middle of that, you know, category. Um, it, it seemed to me always, and, and now one caveat um, is that if I make a statement, that statement is only what I believe, quote, at the moment, um, but also not intended to, to suggest any sort of universal truth. So um, if I say that the rules surrounding watercolor never interested me, I'm not at all suggesting, number one, that they weren't valid, number one, that they weren't a valid interest for thousands and thousands of, if not millions of people, or that anyone should not be interested in them. Only that in my, in my experience, those rules seemed unnecessary. Um, and I didn't, I, I think it's always any, it's always good to work within a system. It may be preferable to work within a system that's self-generated rather than generated from the outside. Um, but systems and boundaries give you something to, to, to bounce off. Um, to either reject or embrace or to investigate, et cetera, et cetera. So the rules that permeated the discipline of watercolor from the post-war years up through the 70s, um, I think I, I don't have any feeling about them other than I tried to embrace those that I thought applied to me and, and ignore totally those that I thought didn't. Um, but in terms of in terms of the various supports that I use, the only the only real reason, and it's a very and, and both of them are very practical. The reasons that I went to working on canvas and working on panel was simply number one, the size issue back in the day was very difficult to get watercolor paper that was huge and so on. Now, we all now work on Reeves BFK printmaking paper that comes in these huge rolls and so forth. But back when I was learning the sport, um, that wasn't really that available. Um, and the other reason that, that I, 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 and I never exclusively worked on canvas and panel, I always did works on paper. But one reason to move um, to the different supports was very simply economic. 
framing watercolors or even doing it yourself was both expensive and for me, difficult. And so if I wanted, and I know Rocco that you're doing some amazing things with large scale watercolor now and different supports, which I think is, is tremendous. Um, we didn't have back in the day that technology. Um, and so for me, it seemed a little bit simpler if I wanted to do a 60 inch piece or a eight foot piece or something like that, simply to go to canvas, even though the paint I used was always water soluble. I've never worked in oils. I have actually have an allergy. Um, and so I've never thought what I did, regardless of the support, was anything other than water media, which is, I guess, the new phrase uh, for watercolor. Everything I, all, all the paint I use is very, is water soluble, it's very liquid. Um, when I create the paint, uh, I do it in a very, um, not traditional, but in a very watercolory kind of way. And that's something that um, has always been native to my understanding in terms of the way paint works uh, as water so as a, wa a water soluble element. That was poorly said, sorry about that. But um, so I've never really, really left watercolor at all. It's just a matter of which support do you choose to use? Yeah, I, uh, I learned uh, that you could, uh, with time, new, new elements come out, new, new things come out to make, bring watercolor painting actually back from the dead edge. Because uh, I had a lot of stuff from the 70s that I go, you know, now I think I can fix this 40 years later. Yeah, because of liquid inks, uh, India ink, which, you know, Calkins loved back then, and, and I love it. Now there's white India ink, and there's, uh, which are permanent colors. And, uh, and then the French watercolor crayons and that are, you can wash with water, but still draw with it as well on the painting. So, and again, uh, you know, learning how to seal watercolor paper to gator board to create that canvas-like stiffness on rolled watercolor paper. Because now you can buy mm -hmm. it that are uh, 25 yards long to do six foot, eight foot paintings and seal them so you don't need glass, you don't need a mat. Uh, and just like the painting behind you, it, it comes across like an oil or acrylic and, uh, and not have to worry about uh, you know damaging the arches paper. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, you know, the, what technology has wrought, I think, has, has indirectly influenced, of course, the kind of images that one is able to make and so forth. Um, but in essence, in, in looking back over the course of the last 30 years or so, um, I would say that tech, the best thing about um, the changes in paint technology uh, is that it has made achieving what one hopes to achieve easier. Um, I remember I, I worked with uh, Sam Golden's paints for years and years and years. And, and I think what, what Golden Colors has contributed um, to the field of water-soluble painting is really remarkable. But when you and I were in school, that there simply weren't any golden acrylics, yeah. you know, to use um, and so forth. Now the, uh, let's talk about Michigan watercolor a little bit. So yeah, did you get involved from, uh, from your dad just being around it or, or did you, did Calkins get you involved like he did me and Paula? Well, well you, absolutely. Um, even though my father, um, spoke about the watercolor society and so forth. By the time I was moderately conscious, he wasn't entering show watercolor shows or anything like that. And so it was always the people that he knew, um, Thad Rakowski, um, uh, Bill Bostic, uh, Mary Jane, uh, and people like that, that were associated with the watercolor society. 
Uh, and I met them through his references before I ever met them personally. Um, so the, I got involved in the Watercolor Society um, based on the direct influence of Paula Zacks, Lula Nestor, and Electra Stamelis. Uh, and we all met in King Calkins' advanced watercolor class at Eastern. And that was, in hindsight, that was, that was quite a heady brew back then. Yeah. No, I, they definitely sucked me in. <laughs> and I think uh, if anyone remembers uh, uh, Electra Stamelis, don't know that she probably ran that class more than Calkins did <laughs> when she was in there. That was her nature. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt, I felt very fortunate that Electra was willing to take me under her intellectual wing and sort of explain to me in very simple terms that I could understand how things worked. And I don't simply mean painting, it was how the, the art world worked, um, how the watercolor society worked, et cetera, et cetera. And she, you know, Electra was a great teacher. And it, it, it seemed to me that she could never actually stop teaching. Yeah. So she was a huge influence on my thinking, if not my actual painting. Well, Peter, uh, we're having I, I was kind of going through our signature uh, list of people, and uh, we only had historical data back going about 10, 12 years. And I remember you were in, in the Michigan Watercolor Show almost every year you entered. And uh, you were in the show the last three of the last 10 years, because then you just stopped entering. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you entered one more time, you would both and got in, you would both be a signature member as well as a Great Lakes fellow for your board experience. But, uh, well, I appreciate that. I guess my laziness has done me in. Um, but, I, but, but I will say in, um, in all fairness, uh, um, my wife and I have moved around a good bit. Um, uh, from Dayton, we moved to uh, Northwest Ohio where she was uh, practicing at a hospital. And then after that, we moved to Taos, New Mexico um, based on her practice. Uh, and so once I left Dayton, my great big studio, I had to close. And I had a studio in Bryan, Ohio, in a, in a little storefront, which was pretty quaint and pretty chilly in Northwest Ohio. Um, and then I also had a studio in Taos. Um, and the work I, I completed in the three years in Taos has not been photographed, framed, uh, or anything. It's been in, uh, essentially in uh, storage for the last few years. Um, and I do have a space here in Corrales. And for those of you unfamiliar with New Mexico, which I was until we moved, um, Corrales is a tiny little farming community right on the flank of, of the giant, busy, um, unpleasant city of Albuquerque. Um, we have, we only have two roads. Uh, they run parallel speed limit, top speed limit is 30 miles an hour. And we have a very active and interested police force that, um, enforces the speed limit, um, with great zeal. Uh, most of the people here own horses, uh, it's a very green spot along the Rio Grande River. Uh, and um, when my wife uh, started to practice in Albuquerque and we moved from Taos, uh, we bought a house that had what they refer to as a casita, which is a thousand foot space. Uh, it's a separate building actually uh, from the house itself. And since that time, we have been planning to turn it into a studio. It's not plumbed or heated or anything like that. So in this climate, that presents a bit of a problem. But I really haven't painted since Taos. Um, I, I'm pretty comfortable, to be honest with you, I'm pretty comfortable being retired from painting. It doesn't mean I won't paint again. I've retired twice. 
Um, but right now I'm, I'm focusing my efforts on fiction and I'm uh, very close to polishing off uh, my second novel, um, which believe it or not, uh, is set in the Detroit art scene of the late 70s. So, wow. so I haven't really left art uh, and painting. I've only changed my, uh, my medium. Well, speaking of that, and again, you got to let us know when that book comes out. And I absolutely will. We'll, we'll check Facebook. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll definitely uh, promote it with Michigan Watercolor, that's for sure. Well, hmm. what was your experience? I know, uh, you know, I found an old picture. And again, I, I'm going to post all these images of Peter's <laughs> artwork when I send out the uh, recording message. Uh, but uh, we had a, there's a picture of you on the board with Paula, Lulu, uh, Marilyn, uh, and then a few others that I remember from back then. And uh, you have, you know, of course, this was the late uh, 70s, early 80s. So we all had a lot of hair. I have none. But uh, <laughs> but when I had it, it was thick. <laughs> and yours was definitely thick. Those were the days, right? And I will say that you touched briefly about that, that experience on the board and along with Electra and somewhat later um, than my um, friendship with Electra, um, Marilyn Duenskis proved to be a great mentor. Now, not only is she a tremendous and energetic and amazing person and painter, um, but she, she went to great pains to explain to me how this whole watercolor board thing worked and so forth. And the few years that I spent on the board, uh, I believe she was chairman that whole time, or at least a good bit of the time. Um, and working with her was, I will say, a rare education. Um, she had a pr profound effect on, my, on the direction of my thinking about groups about institutions, um, about how the larger and more social entities of the art world worked. Um, and she had a great practical way about her, you know. She didn't suffer fools gladly, but she also didn't suffer lazy people gladly. Um, and I found that really energizing. I was afraid of her, frankly. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's quite a pistol, uh, even today. At at uh, 88, I mean, uh, she just, I, I knew she was gonna enter in our show this year. She, she became our first Lifetime Achievement Award winner last year. So yeah, we well came, deserved. We yeah. came up with an award and uh, she made our 75th annual exhibition that much more special because she invited her family from all over the country to come to see her receive that award. And, uh, you know, she, she can hardly, see her hands are very she can't even hold a brush very well anymore but she cranked out a piece she entered this year's exhibition and uh i i had a, a few years back i created a, a chairman's show just a secondary show just to keep people engaged and and grow our volunteerism and uh and i said you know we'd like to have you come in she says i'll i'll ship you four pieces i'll ship you my marriage <laughs> my Mary Jane Bigler piece. And, uh, and then she came up from Tennessee, her daughter, you know, they flew in together and they spent the weekend and she was surrounded by her students. And, uh, she says, you got me excited again. So she's been painting ever since. And, uh, she calls me all the time out of the blue. And what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And I go, <laughs> man, you got so much energy. I hope I have it when I'm your age. Oh boy, yeah, she's an amazing uh, woman. And I got a, a short e email um, from her last week. Um, but I think about Marilyn, I think about her contributions, which were many uh, to both the society and to me personally as an artist and so forth. But perhaps the most long lived and salient um, contribution she made to my understanding was that more than perhaps anyone else that I met from that era, at least watercolors from that era, Marilyn understood that painting 
was an act of investigation. That it wasn't about production, producing, you know, rote pieces. That each painting would reveal something if you worked hard enough, if you looked hard enough, uh, and if you were willing to see that relinquishing control gave you a better result than keeping everything all, you know, tight and pat and so forth. Marilyn was, in my mind, um, one, one of the best in terms of ability painters who, who, um, who, who let's see, who, I'm trying to think of the, uh, of the word now, who, who was a, sort of an emblem for that idea of investigation. Now, you can, I mean, I, certainly we all meet, meet that idea in various guises. Uh, um, most of the great painters from the 60s and 70s um, agreed with that and so forth. So I'm not suggesting that it was an original idea with Marilyn, rather that she lived that idea. Um, and it obviously shows in her work, which seems never to rest. Right. Well, let's, we've got a few minutes. I want to talk more about your art for people to uh, kind of understand your process. Uh, you know, I've looked at a lot of images. Again, I don't know why I can't see these, but uh, uh, you are sharing your screen, but nobody can see it, right? Yeah. Uh, that. I'm trying to get to your work here. Killing this. Yeah, right now I got a blank screen. Yeah. Except I see you up there. Uh, I'm just trying to get to the, so I can see him. Uh, you had a series from, and again, uh, these are large pieces. They were six foot, eight foot pieces from different locations that you've been around the world. Mm -hmm. And one was, uh, uh, well, let me see if I can bring this right there. There, there we go. Okay. One was the Florentine series. And it seems like there's a lot of stuff happening in that piece. I, I'm not seeing it. Uh, yeah, I know you're not. I'm trying to bring okay. it up so I see it. And it's the uh, very gold looking piece with a lot of angles and, and lines and mm -hmm. just a lot of, a lot of texture. <clears throat> well, um, following Mar Marilyn's example of, uh, of art and painting being uh, an act of inquiry, um, my career I worked in very long and some would say ponderous series investigating a single idea. Um, the one you're referring to, which I actually can't see, uh, uh, was part of a, a much larger series uh, called the Florentine series, um, which was essentially taking, um, let's see how I can describe this, taking the feel of um, the Pitti Palace in Florence, um, the coffered ceilings, um, the various artworks. And obviously, um, I'm not talking about Raphael now, but, but certainly his portraits in the Pitti Palace are amazing. Um, but the, taking the feel of the Pitti Palace and translating that feel into a lush kind of geometry. Does, did that make any, any yes. sense at all? Yeah, I, there's a lot of geometric shapes in your work, very linear. Uh, you know, I, as I after I started looking at some of your work, because I haven't seen it in a while, and I'm going, I'm kind of doing some of the same things with watercolor. For me, it's more architectural uh, than than what you're doing. But uh, the, you had a one red painting that you entered in the show. Uh, let's see if I have a title for that. <clears throat> sure, I remember that one. 
and it glowed. Uh, it's called Sun Red. Right, right. And that, and, that, and that will allow me actually to, I think, to make a better sense than uh, I, I, I did with the Florentine series, which were very sensual pieces, very textural, uh, very lush um, paintings. But the New Zealand paintings actually came from a, from a single experience in nature. Uh, my wife and I were out on a place called Oredi Beach, which is the very, very south tip of the South Island of, of New Zealand. Um, from there, you can smell the ice of the Antarctic, and the sun has a very particular quality, a, a quality unlike, almost a hallucinatory quality, uh, unlike um, light quality that I've, I've met anywhere else. Um, not Africa, not, not uh, Italy, um, not, not the Southwest, et cetera, et cetera. And so I did a long series of paintings that were essentially inspired, if you want to use that word, by being present with that sun. They weren't pictures of the sun. They were meant to represent how it felt to be in the presence of that rather amazing sun. And um, truth be told, all of my work has been, has, has come directly from observation of the physical world that's then translated through the lens of my own particular preferences and vision. So they're, 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 I don't think I've ever painted a painting which didn't have somewhere deep down the line an actual physical reference. And in the case of that painting, it was the experience of being on that particular beach on a very windy day where the sun was as hazy and, and I would say crazy as you can imagine. Um, I also sent you um, a couple of the Boku series, which came from Ethiopia, right. which, which are not a direct reference to, but which allude to um, what several tribes in, in Southern Ethiopia refer to as a talking stick. It's very much like a peace pipe for the American Indians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that talking stick, the Boku, is passed from tribe member to tribe member. And that tribe member that holds the stick can speak. And the tribe member that possesses the stick is the leader. And so I like that idea. I saw several of them. They're not as ornate as what, as what I came up with, but um, I actually thought of, of those long, uh, very narrow verticals of the Boku series as um, emblems of that particular uh, artifact. Does that make any sense? Yeah. yeah. So they didn't just spring out of my brain or whatever. They, they actually had a a reference in the physical world. I don't think I've ever not done that. So for people that are kind of new with watercolor in general, or they're new as artists, uh, you've exhibited. Did you exhibit mainly because you were teaching or did you go out and search galleries to, to show your work? What was your process of getting some exposure? Ah, <clears throat> very good. A really excellent question. And, and, and not one that I anticipated, but it does, um, it is something that, that's in the compendium of my uh, fairly um, important memories. And King Calkins recognized um, the impulse um, in me fairly early when I was thinking of going to graduate school at Montana State in Bozeman. Um, what King said, very frankly, is, and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, sadly, I can't quote him. He said, Pete, where are you going to show? You've always shown, you like showing, and it seems to drive your art. So where in Bozeman, Montana, do you expect to show your work? And I didn't have an answer for that. I went out to Montana. I looked around. I loved it. I was into mountaineering at the time. It seemed like a great place to go. But the truth of King's words uh, came back um, pretty powerfully when I got back to Ann Arbor. 
Um, and it became clear as much as I might like Bozeman, Montana, um, that it wasn't going to uh, be a fairly fertile um, ground for my, for my own painting. Um, but to answer your question directly, and, I, and to me, this is really a kind of bedrock issue. To me, painting is an act of communication. It's a very direct, in a way, kind of communication one to one. And I think I believe this because I grew up surrounded almost in a museum of paintings, lived with them day in and day out. They were always there. And so a world where there weren't paintings was rather alien to me. Um, but the paintings that hung in my parents' house were very much engaged in a kind of communication with me as I was growing up simply by looking at them, finding new things to look at, remembering things. They were a jumping off point for lots of imagination. And so when I paint, although I'm not, very, I'm not necessarily conscious of it in the frontal lobes, I'm always attempting to make something that will communicate on a fairly intimate, sincere level to another human being. Does that make sense? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the, that's the point of it. And, and like you, I've been to museums all over the world, you know, until it's coming out of my head. Um, but the engagement, the profound engagement that one has, um, say with a Zerberon crucifixion in the Prado, that, that you sit for an hour trying to absorb and, and being dwarfed by. Um, for me, that, that means and meant more than a lecture in an art history room, although I didn't, certainly didn't ignore those, or I did, but I shouldn't have. What were, uh, what were the issues of the day when you were on the board? Oh, boy. <sighs> Um, let me broaden that. Out. Let me broaden that out a little bit because I, let me let me say what were the issues of the day, uh, and they were certainly present in the board. As a matter of fact, I think the, that the, the the primary issue that I felt plagued by and driven by um, was an issue that Grace Hardigan, when she came to jury the the watercolor show and I discussed it at huge length on the drive um, back to Ann Arbor from, from uh, Detroit was originality. And Grace talked on and on about, about Bill de Kooning, who she, as you all probably know, uh, was very, what should we say, close to. Um, and I'm gonna paraphrase Grace. I was very young when I was talking to her, she was not. She just had her second hip replacement. She reminded me a little bit, or maybe it's the other way around, of Mary Jane Bigler in a way. Now, Grace was a really tough woman, and I loved her for that. Um, but when I brought up the subject of originality, she just kind of laughed. We're in my father's car driving back from, from Detroit. Uh, and she said, any painter who worries about originality doesn't need to. In other words, if you're thinking about it, <clears throat> you're not original. Um, and I, 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 that stayed with me for a very long time. And I think it, it made, and perhaps, <clears throat> excuse me, and perhaps makes more sense back then in the age of heroic painting than it does now. As a matter of fact, it probably sounds kind of quaint um, but back in the days when the shadows of the Abexers were very, very long and their lives and philosophies were very much present in art departments, the issue of originality um, was much talked about. And I think Grace's point was that no amount of academic chatter is going to make an individual original. That's, that's an innate quality. Can't be learned. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's very, very true. Sorry, that was pretty long-winded. No, that's, 
this is all great stuff. And I, I think our audience uh, appreciated this kind of this kind of discussion. I mean, I haven't uh, we don't get into these that much. And I, I, I've been trying to start the, the old art exchange. I, I don't know if you were involved in any of those back with Electra and Paula. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and that was awesome. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate to have King at my house uh, before he uh, he left. And uh, those are just neat things. But, you know, if there's any questions, people, uh, feel free to put them in the chat window and we can discuss it. And uh, just a couple of comments that aren't technically related. <laughs> uh, you know, Lisa DeLuca is on the call here. And she came a little after, but she was good friends with uh, Lulu Nestor. And I think Lulu probably got her involved. And uh, so mm -hmm. she had Kingsley. Uh, she graduated in 82. She had Tammany, Pappas. And Pappas, if you remember John Pappas. Oh, John is one of my favorite human beings. He is still alive and still doing commission sculpture work. Uh, I had him here at the house a few months ago. His daughter brought her, brought him over and it was just gonna be for a few minutes. He stayed for lunch and we had a three hour conversation. And uh, he just got a, uh, and I posted on the Michigan Watercolor site. Uh, I think I did, they, Eastern just did an interview with him about him and his work. So he's uh, he's doing great. He's the only uh, mentor I think I still have left from the good old days. Uh, let's see. The question here was Carl Lopez, a section of fine art artist who created post office murals in Plymouth and Birmingham. It may not be the same guy looking at his. Now, what was the name again? What's that? I didn't I didn't hear the, the part about the, the name of the artist that did uh, uh, Carl Lo Carl Lopez. Carl Lopez. Oh, that would have been Carlos. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that would have been him, huh? That would have been a WPA project, I believe. Okay. Yeah, I actually I, I put that one up. This is Cheryl. And there was a section of finance was almost WPA, but it was only in federal buildings and you had a it was more qualifications to become a section of fine arts artist than a WPA artist. I, I did one of my one of my masters, I did a project. A thesis on on section of fine art artists. I thought it was him. Okay. Yes. Um, my re recollection suggests that numerous faculty from U of M, and now now Carlos also taught in Detroit, and I don't right. have his cr chronology uh, in front of me, but I know he did that. Numerous faculty at U of M, and I'm sure Wright State. Um, during the WPA, um, did murals. My dad did four or five of them in schoolhouses and post offices and that kind of thing. I, th I think they're all destroyed now. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me a bit if Carlos did uh, a mural in Birmingham because he was as familiar in Detroit as he was in Ann Arbor. Now, remember, he died in 1953. So, um, he was very much just in that immediate post-war era. Yeah. So the, I think the Wilt we were talking about that taught drawing was Ellen Wilt. Uh, so she may not have been the wife of Richard Wilt. No, she was. I think oh, she I was. call her Bonnie because that was her nickname. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember yeah, her very well. Oh my gosh, She's one of my favorite people. Yeah, Lisa Tennant had Ellen, and she had Pappas as well, Igor. Well, I, I had Igor for commercial art, and he said, you know, this isn't for you. You should take watercolor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, he was teaching it. <laughs> oh, Igor was a great guy. Yeah. I, uh, I, got, I got a photo with him at the last exhibition of the Michigan watercolor that he was in. He won an award, and I think he died a few months later. Uh, mm -hmm. after that. We were, mm -hmm. It was at the BBAC the last time we were there. So that was special. Uh, yeah, Peter, I took I, three, three of his classes at Eastern. And I think that, that as a foundation for watercolor understanding and technique, Igor was a master. Um, he was a very gentle teacher, very smart guy. And of course, obviously, um, uh, an amazing painter 
uh, with a very, very, ex except for one period in when he was going through some personal difficulties. Um, with, uh, generally, Igor's touch was one of the most delicate touches uh, with a brush that I've ever been around. Yeah, I still remember the techniques that he taught and uh, just the wave of the brush and this twist this way and twist that way. <laughs> right. Just to create a different line. And uh, and that's the way I paint today. I, I can't, I won't just draw a straight line. I, it's got a wave and bend and even holding a crayon that way. But uh, Peter, this was great. I'm, I'm glad we finally had a chance to talk. Well, thank you, Rocco. Appreciate it. And we're uh, this is recorded, so uh, like I said, I'm going to send some of Peter's artwork along with the recorded session where you can see it, and uh, from there, and I'll try to figure out why this time I wasn't able to share images where I've been able to in the past. So uh, I don't uh, know. Technology. Different camera. I I don't know. But we'll work uh, it out. Well, thank you very much. I want to, I, before we close, I just want to say thanks for the opportunity. It's great to catch up. Um, you've brought back some very fond memories for me. Um, uh, although I'm way out in the Southwest now, the Michigan Watercolor Society uh, remains quite dear to my heart. Well, I'm a cheap therapist. And uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, I get a lot of therapy out of this. And uh, so uh, I enjoy doing it. And again, uh, like I said earlier in the introductions, if you know of others that you think that we could all benefit from a conversation with, uh, feel free to let me know. It doesn't take a lot of work, uh, especially as unorganized as I am. We just go for it. And uh, <laughs> so thank you, guys. I appreciate Sounds it. Sounds good. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks, Rocco. Thank you, Rocco. Thanks for yep. doing that. You bet.